Okay, and the thought question, how can we live a holy life? It's awful when you get old and you can't see anymore. Okay, um, would you bow with me? Father God, thank you for this day and thank you for the, the privilege we have of being here this morning and to assemble together to, to worship you to sing songs of praise to your name, to listen to your word, to encourage and, and build one another up. I just pray, Father, that as we go through this time, I pray, Father, that we would be able to put aside the things, other things from our minds and to concentrate on what it is we're about to do. I pray, Father, that the things that we do here this morning would be pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen. Yeah. 
we'll sing this song this morning to prepare our hearts and minds for the Lord's Supper. Good morning. <clears throat> the thoughts I have this morning, which I'm still not for sure exactly what I, what I want to say or how it's going to come out, which is, which is okay. And I, some of these thoughts that I want to share, I might have touched on them before, but that's okay. Um, what I've been thinking about, I think quite often, is do you have your own personal hall of fame, so to speak, of people who led you to Christ, you know, somebody that you have a special affection for. Um, I, I do. I think about them often. Uh, I think about them uh, oftentimes uh, when we come together to, uh, to partake of, of the Lord's Supper. Um, in the same way, you know, the, they are special in the same way the body here, you guys are special to me. Uh, we're special to each other. And, you know, what's the, what's the common denominator? The, we know the string uh, that holds us all together, so to speak, uh, bind, binds us all together, uh, is Christ. That's one of the reasons uh, we are here this morning. Um, we recognize that uh, only through God's plan, only through Christ's sacrifice, uh, can we have forgiveness and be with be with uh, with God uh, for eternity at some point in time. Uh, would you bow with me this morning as we uh, give thanks for the for the bread, uh, dear Heavenly Father? God, thank you. We come before you now. God, I thank you for our our Christian ancestors, so to speak, um, who trusted you, who recognized uh, Christ for uh, for who He was and for what He did. And God, we come to you this morning. God, he is, we have our own special people to give thanks for. 
but it's only because of Christ. God, it leads us back, it all points back uh, to his sacrifice for his belief, for his love for you, his love for us. God, I'm thankful again for what he went through as we just sang about. Uh, God, it's humbling. Uh, I, I still try to imagine, but I, I can't, uh, what he went through for us. God, I thank you for the body, uh, for Christ's body being put on that cross. God, I'm thankful that we can be together today to remember his sacrifice. Thank you for this bread, for what it represents. God, thank you, and it's through your son's name I pray. Amen. thanks for the cup. Almighty Heavenly Father, God, we again want to thank you. I thank you for the love. Thank you for uh, the reason that we can be here <clears throat> today uh, to be, God, we are, we have sinned, we are sinners, but it's only through uh, Christ's blood that covers uh, our sins. God, again, thank you for, <clears throat> for the plan. I thank you for Christ fulfilling your plan for his death, for his burial, for his resurrection. God, I thank you for the, for the cup, for what it represents. God, I thank you for his blood. God, thank you for your love and, and his love for us. God, thank you for forgiveness. We ask that you continue to forgive us as we forgive others. I just pray that we can be the example that we should be. God, thank you, and it's through your son's name I pray. Amen. Now we will uh, take this opportunity to, to give back. I hope you've thought about uh, giving today. I hope you think about it. Oh, we should be thinking about it every week, making plans. Um, we are blessed in so many ways, and uh, we want to take this time to give thanks. Would you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you again for a beautiful day. God, I thank you for a beautiful week. God, it was hot. But we thank you for the sunshine. God, we thank you for, uh, for the rain uh, that we've had. God, it's, you, are, you are amazing. And you bless us in so many ways, um, physically, but more importantly, spiritually. Uh, God, we want to take this opportunity uh, to give back. God, again, we pray for, God, I pray for wisdom for each and every one of us. Again, everything we say, everything we do. I uh, also want to ask for, uh, for wisdom for those who, who take this this offering and, and use it to, to further your work, to further the kingdom. God, again, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being who you are, creator, Lord, and master. And um, all, we ask all these things through your son's name. Amen. We'll sing this song before our lesson, and after this song, the kids will be dismissed. Do we praise? So let's all stand and sing to the best of your ability to glorify God and encourage our, our speaker this morning. There is much to do. There is work on every hand.
was the hard part, getting up here. Um, I want to thank you for letting me uh, speak to you today. I pray the message will, will impact your life. Uh, we got to, I want to talk, finish up this month about the holiness of God. Uh, before I get into my lesson, I want to tell you kind of how my week has went. Just real quickly, uh, Eddie and Linda were at the hospital. And uh, anyway, and I'd, I had a card I'd made for them a week ago, and you guys all signed it and everything. And I left it in here on the, the table. Well, I left those other cards too. Well, I thought, well, I'm going to go visit them anyway because they took Linda out to the hospital in an ambulance. And I wanted to pray with Eddie and, and uh, see his family for a few minutes. And so I came to the building. I unlocked the building. I picked up the cards. I had Alma's birthday card and, and um, Carolyn Fouts' card you signed. And anyway, and guess what I did with my keys? I left them laying on the counter right back there. So I, I walked out to my car. Of course, I left it running because it's hot out, right? And I get in my car, I drive to the hospital, I pray with Eddie and visit with his family for a few minutes, go back to my van, and guess what? It won't start. i got to tell you this story because Vernon was going to use it anyway, so i gotta, I got to fess up on the front. That's what, that's what Isaiah did. He confessed, okay? And that's what I'm doing. Anyway, so I called Vernon. I said, what are you doing? He said, man, I ain't doing nothing. I said, can you... Can you come and get me and take me to church and get da-da-da-da-da? So anyway, that was part of my week. But God is good, isn't he? And somehow, believe it or not, I've uh, I've torn another groin muscle. And I've really been in a lot of pain for the last couple days. But anyway, made a lot of cinnamon rolls with my helpers. And and if there's any left over, you're welcome to take them home with you. Uh, But anyway, I want to ask the question. Why would... uh, Someone so extraordinary care for you and me. Why would someone so extraordinary care for you and me? God's holiness is an attribute that wraps itself around all the other attributes that we've looked at to this point. I believe it's the foundation of of, of our very God. You know, in Leviticus chapter 11... 44 and 45, Cooper, if you want to throw that up there for me, Leviticus chapter 11, 44 and 45, he says there in this, in this verse, I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground, I am the Lord who brought you up from Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy because I am holy. You know, when I was reading Leviticus, it made me stop and ask the question, why, Lord? Why is the Lord so tough? Why does he have all these requirements? And you think about it, these rules are so strict on these people, but you quickly realize the holiness of God when you read that. And you realize that he, Leviticus was written by Moses, as many of us know, it was a handbook. It was a guide for holy living and the, for these Hebrew people. And see, God had delivered them from a pagan nation, from a, those Egyptians, people who did not serve him. Not only did, did they not serve him, but their practices were ridiculous. They were horrible. Matter of fact, some of them even sacrificed their very own children to their God. Their false God. So God gave them clear understanding, clear standards for holy living. You see, and, and throughout the Old Testament, you're going to say, be holy because I am holy. We sang a song just a few minutes ago about the holiness of God and what it's like for me and you to be holy. And what I want to challenge us today is, if we're not holy, if we're not walking in holiness each and every day of our life, I want you to take that home with you today. I want you to reevaluate your life and look at what it means to really be a holy people. You see, they were, they were to be distinct. They were to be different from those pagan worshipers and the people around them. And Leviticus 18, verses 2 through 4 said, he says, Speak to those Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live, 
And you must not do what they do in the land of Canaan where you're going. Do not, he says, do not follow their practices. You must obey the laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. You see, the Israelites were moved from the land of idols. And they were in this infested country, if you will. But they were moving to a country that was just like it in some ways. And God was helping them form a new culture, a new state of mind, a new practice. He warned them to leave all those and leave any aspect of that pagan religion behind. He went on to say it's, it's, it's easy. And I believe it is easy today for us to slip back in some of our old practices. And people do that from time to time. But I'm telling you, he said it's easy to slip back into evil and unholy practices. And he did this. He put those rules together because he loved them. He loves us. And that's why he teaches this to us today. He did this because he loved us. He chose, he chose them. He chose you and me. We're adopted. We're sons of his. And, you know, he set them apart. And the people, he loved them so much. He wanted them to represent him. He wanted you and me to represent him. I want us to get that. Friends, that love is still to, here today. It has not changed. He's not changed on the day God sent his son to die for our sins. He still calls us to be a people who are holy, a holy people. You, you and I were chosen people. We were anointed to live a purposeful, sin-free, sin, sinless life. I, I shouldn't say sin-free. That would be great if you could get there. But no one's Sin free are they, Chuck? Ain't going to happen. Set aside time to read God's holiness. Set aside time to pray to your heavenly Father. Set aside time to, to think about his mercy. Set aside time to, to look at his deep love because he loves us so deeply. What is holiness? It's, it's a life to be set apart. To be holy, to be morally blameless, if you will. To live a holy life and live a life in conformity to the teachings of the word. How can you be in conform, conformity to the teachings of the Word? It's by spending time in it, by looking to it, looking for ways to understand it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7, as I look, and I'm going to get right into my lesson, but this is just a, a, a teaser if you are a trailer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. Let's, let's pray right now, okay? Father God, I pray that we'll open up our minds and our eyes and our hearts as we look at your word today. And I pray that the things that are spoken will be things that will, will, will challenge us to really live a holy life. To, and if we're not doing that, God, I beg you, if there's anyone in this, this body here today or anybody listening uh, throughout on Facebook or whatever, I just pray that God, that this will make a difference and they'll realize how important it is for us to be holy. And, and make every effort to be holy. Thank you, God, for your son. Thank you for Jesus being willing to give up his life so that I can have that, that hope of eternal life. And again, I just ask for, for prayers on this body, and thank you for all that you do. Thank you for loving us in your precious name. Beautiful and sweet name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that, that is holy and honorable. And he goes on to say, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and not in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins. As we are told, you're warned and you're warned for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. You see, in 1 Peter chapter 1, I was going to use this as my, my turning point verse, if you will. But 1 Peter chapter 1, 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as you are called, just as you were who called you holy is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I'm written. When you, be holy because I'm written. No, be holy because I am holy. It is written is what I wanted to say. And where was it written at? All the way back in Isaiah, right? 
and also in Leviticus and other places. But anyway, in Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, you were taught with your former way of life to put off your old self, in, which is being corrupted by deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind. I always said it, and I've, Bern and I've talked about this a lot. It all starts right here, friends. You know, what you get in your mind, that's what's really critical. That's the basis for it. He says, you were taught with regard to your former life. Put off your old self, which is corrupted by deceitful desires. Be made new in the attitude of your mind. To put on new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And then that last one I thought about was Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. And Kurt used this last week. You know, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to present your bodies as living sacrifices. And he goes on to say, Do, excuse me, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And he goes on to say, Do not, do not. Can I say it again? Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to approve and test God's will is, his good, pleasing will. God's holiness is for you. I remember back a few years ago, and it has been a few years ago, as a, as a beautiful little church in Bryansville, Indiana. I was standing waiting up front, and it was hot. And I was waiting for this beautiful young girl to walk down this aisle. And I remember that. It was a hot day, and I didn't mind it. My brother did. He was sitting there wobbling. Matter of fact, they thought he was going to pass out. I think someone did catch him. But anyway, it was hot. You see, friends, she was so beautiful. And I was overjoyed as she walked down that aisle. And I think about it today. You know, it was a day that was set apart. There's not going to be another day like it. It's the day we got married. It's ingrained in my memory. It's ingrained in my heart to that very day today. You see, and it was called, anybody want to guess? Holy matrimony. Holy matrimony. You see, set apart is what it really means, but it means so much more than that. When Stephen and Lydia... We're each born those days. It took a few years after our wedding. Matter of fact, I kept telling Vernon, Blenda, and others that were close friends, we ain't having no kids. Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Well, I'm so glad we did because now I got grandkids. I'm just kidding, Stephen. But anyway, uh, each birth in that day was so special. And you realize it's special. It was set apart. It was set apart. And you kind of want to hold that, that young boy, that baby boy in your arm, and you throw him up to the sky and say, ah, oh, kuma matata, or whatever the lion kid did, you know. But anyway, the thing I'm saying, it was set apart. It was special. I might add, the reality of it was I, I, was a, I became a dad. And Beth became a mama. And I, I'm going to throw this in there because I want to get points. She's a really good mama. But anyway, we had these tiny humans, Lydia and Stephen, and we had to take care of them. And it was kind of scary. I can tell you all kinds of stories. I can tell you the first time I changed his diaper, but I won't. Okay, but anyway, it's set apart. And friends, there'll never be another day like that, will there? Won't happen. But we... You know what's really neat is every year we set apart a day, don't we, to celebrate that, don't we? It's called a birthday. That means to set apart, there's nothing like it. There will never be another Stephen. There will never be another Lydia. Each is special and each is significant. My simple attempt right now was just to help you understand the concept that God is holy. It's where I want this lesson to take our hearts today. It's what I want us to focus on. I want us to understand. As I mentioned early in this lesson, the attributes that help us define all attributes as we talk about them. We've been through them. You know, we're, we're, working, we're working our way, and I think the, the last ones as they come, they're all the foundation of us right here. Holy, holy, holy. You see, Kurt made it clear last week when, when he looked at his lesson of holiness, he is set apart. 
He's infinitely and altogether different than anything else. Anything. He's unique. He's special. He's wonderful. He's beautiful. He's kind. I can go on. There's nothing like him. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's all, oh man, he's awesome. And when we look at God, here's the neat thing. He is unchanging. His love is altogether different than anything else in the world that we have ever experienced and anything that anyone else in the world could ever offer us. We would say God's love is holy. God's justice is holy. We would say God's anger is holy. God's mercy is holy. He's altogether different and, and than anything else you could ever hope for. He is sovereign. He, he is the, you know, the supreme ruler over every aspect of our lives. God is holy. God is above all. God is beyond all. God is perfect. God is pure. When we think of God's holiness, we must make, we must make it a personal relationship with us to him. We must make it personal. That is good, but we must be careful to never lose the reverence of our God and Father. If we lose our reverence, our awe for God, our walk could be in danger. Our walk could be in danger of becoming complacent. Friends, we have a God we can personally relate to. And we can personally stand in awe of. And friends, this is the God that I worship. What about you? This is the God I worship. In Exodus 15, 11, Who among God is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, work in wonders? And in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, There's no one holy like the Lord. There's no one beside you. There's no rock like God. And then in 1 Chronicles 16, 29, Ascribe to the Lord God the glory do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in splendor of his holiness. This is critical for us to understand. God is infinitely holy. Because God is holy, he is not neutral on sin. He is not neutral on sin. God takes delight in what is true. God takes delight in what is worthy and honorable. And God takes delight in what is good because God's very nature is that of purity, of being pure. He cannot and he will not, listen to me, this is important, tolerate sin. He cannot and he will not tolerate sin because he's perfect. And friends, that's really good news for each of us that he loves us and he wants us to serve him. And it's important that we follow him. Find time to get in his word. And, and in Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 10, I'm going to kind of, uh, I don't know, unlock this thing try to go through it. Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 10. You can throw it up on the screen, but I'm just going to break it apart as I go through it, okay? And uh, just bear with me. In Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 10, in the year, this is what it starts out at, in the year of King Uzziah, in the year he died, right? I saw the Lord high and exalted, seating on a throne. Who saw the Lord? Isaiah did. I saw the Lord. Let me pause there for you, if you will. Uzziah was king for 52 years. And he was 16 years old when he became king. 16 years old. And he does very well. And God is blessing him. And the power and the might of Israel is, is going forth and it seems to be going really, really good at this time. And the pride of Uzziah goes to his heart and to his mind. And the pride leads him to go to the temple of the Lord and try to take the job of the priest. He gets a censer and he goes into the holy temple and he fills it with incense. He wants to burn, uh, you know, he goes forth with this trying to burn this, this censer in the, holy, in the holy of holies, you know. The Lord strikes him with leprosy on his forehead at that moment. In the last 10 years or so of his reign, he spends absolutely separate from the rest of the kingdom. Friends, Uzziah's reign ends so differently than the way it began because he let pride go before his fall. When you see this passage, we just read the year the king Uzziah died. 
He had been ruling over Israel for a long time, 52 years. Can you imagine President Biden being in charge 52 years? I hope not. But anyway, we'll let that lay. Think about the impact that would make not only on Isaiah, but also the nation of Israel. You can imagine with a king for 52 years, life is going to be changing for the Israelite people and even for Isaiah. And you see here, he goes on to say, in the year of Uzziah the king, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne and his train filled the temple. That's the latter part of that verse. So just bear with me, okay? I'm going to break that down. You see, friends, at, during this time, the kings of earth will rise and fall. But our sovereign God, who put the galaxies in place, and with the power of the word, is still seated on the throne. And that is his throne. And no one will take it from him. But anyway, it says there, and when he says the train filled his temple, that's really significant. Back in that day, with a king, if he had a train... The longer it was, the more powerful he was and the more presence he had. You see, in, in this king that Isaiah saw, his train filled the temple. You see, the longer the train, the more powerful the king. So when we are reading that in Isaiah, the whole robe is filling the temple. There's none like him. It's altogether unique. No one had a train like that. Above him in verse 2 were seraphim. And Chuck talked about this in Revelations class. And these seraphim, each with six wings. Can you imagine them flying around? I thought, I thought this was really interesting when I was looking at it. Two wings covered their faces. And two wings covered their feet. And they were flying around. That would be amazing. That would scare me probably. But think about that. And they were crying out. Do anybody remember what they were crying out? Holy, holy, holy. Why'd they say it three times? I'm going to talk about that for a minute. Hold on to that. Think about it. But anyway, friends, this dazzling seraphim blazing in their intensity for God's glory must cover themselves in the presence of God. And they were calling to one another. Picture this. They were covering their faces. They were flying around. Holy, holy, holy. You know, and I'm thinking, wow. is the Lord Almighty is what they finished that with, okay? That's really important. You might notice that in this verse, the Lord, the Lord, the, the word Lord, if you look at it in your Bible, and come to me if it's different, but L-O-R-D, it's all in capital letters. It's all in capital letters right there. I think that's interesting. And what I think it is, is to designate differently the words for God. The Lord... You'll see in an earlier part of that scripture where that small l, little o, r, d. And what that designates to me is the small, in this verse, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, capital L, O, R, D, is the Lord, that is his name, Yahweh. It's a reference, it's kind of like my name is Jim, my God's name is Yahweh, Lord. You see, in the other one where it's used earlier in the scripture, you'll see small l-o-r-d. And what that's representing is his position. He's master. He's king. You know, and you can go on and on with that. This is the only time in the scripture we see the attribute of God. And when we see holy, 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 it's the only time we see the attribute of God raised to the third level. Holy, holy, holy. When the Jews wanted to say something that was really important, when, when these teachers would talk to their children and they'd want to make a point, they would put an exclamation point after it. That's a big book. But the Jews would say, that's a book book, meaning a big book, okay? And what they were saying here, we would use that, and like, like recently you've seen Bald Knob Cross, and you've seen Beth stand there. If, you got, if you're my Facebook friend, and that cross is, is huge, I would say, that was a big cross, you know, and put an exclamation point. And you look at it, you see Beth standing there. She looked about that tall, and that cross goes, if you haven't seen it, it's really kind of cool to go see. What a giant cross. If the Jews seen it, they would say, that's a cross cross. You know, it's a giant cross. We see Jesus using this several times throughout the scriptures. Truly, truly, 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus saying this for me and you to dig in, get it. This is important. I want you to hear what I'm saying. They should have, they could have used a thousand different words on that day instead of holy, holy, holy. They could have said love, 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 which would have been true. They could have said mercy, 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 which would have been true. They could have said justice, 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 which would have been true. And all things would have been true, but they chose to use the word holy because the word designates his other attributes. And I think it's important. So when we think God is as holy, it helps us define his love better now. We could say his love is holy, it is pure, it is precious. There's none like it. His justice is good. His goodness is holy. There is none like it. When you're in Christ, when you're in Christ, when you decide you want to live for him, you're a new creation. And he loves you. Friends, we need to have a consuming fire within us is what the scripture says. Within us. To grow and be transformed into what he is. How beautiful is the concept of God's holiness. We see the example throughout the scriptures. The story of Moses at the burning bush. Many of you know the story. We don't need to turn to it. But I want you to think about it. As Moses approaches the burning bush. He hears a voice. God says. The place where you are standing. Is holy ground. Why is it holy? Because God is in the presence. Would it normally be holy? I don't think so. It's holy because God was there. God tells Moses, take off your shoes. You're standing in holy ground. We see it again in a harsh example. Listen to me. In a harsh, harsh example. God had just ordained Aaron and all of his, his sons to be priests. And two of his sons that you guys know well uh, have heard stories about. Remember Nadab and Abihu? Their lives were taken because they were tried to be, they tried to bring strange fire into the holy temple. They saw fit to do as they wanted, and the holiness of God consumed them at that moment. The holiness of God is really an awesome thing. It should strike within us, within our hearts, a reaction to stand in awe of God. Do we reverence Him? In that moment, they failed to, and they lost their lives. We see another example of the Ark of the Covenant. The oxen stumble, and Uzziah tries to catch the Ark. You remember what happened to him? God is holy and on the spot, and Uzziah drops dead. We cannot simply and flippantly approach God. We can't do it. He's altogether holy. There's an absolute reverence. To your walk and my walk with God. God is amazing. Friends, I don't want us to miss this. God's holiness is a gift. This is something we receive. He preciously gives it to you. And he's able to heal broken hearts. He's able to, to fix broken lives. And restore you and me and bring us to fruition. And he's working with us. In Leviticus 10, it talked about Nahab and Abihu, if you want to look at that. Uh, I'm not going to read that, but I just want you to think about that story. And then we go on, and we're down to Isaiah 6, verse 3, the latter part of it. And that's where those, those angels I hadn't read yet cry out, Holy, 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 the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. <laughs> Check out some of our church family's adventures. You know, Jim was telling me about going to the Grand Canyon. He, he said he went on, I forget, he said he went on the backside of it or, you know, he was telling me, and I don't remember all the details, but he said it was pretty cool, but it wasn't quite as, as much as what he had hoped for. But, but the thing I'm telling you is I've seen some pictures of some of your trips. I've seen some pictures of when, you know, Kylie, your kids were down in the ocean, you know, and, and I've seen pictures of, of some of you others when you were out. i seen some of your trip uh, that you posted, Jessica. And, and I think it's so cool when we look at God's beauty, isn't it? And we know, you know, he, we know he was behind that. You've been to the ocean. You've been to Grand Canyon. You've been in other places. And when you look up and you stand back and you say, wow, God, I'm in awe of you. You're awesome. Look what God has done. When you look up the night star and you look up the sky and you see those stars up there and you think, man, God knew what he was doing, didn't he? We stand in all that. All those things, friends, point us to the fact that his glory is beyond and above. His glory is something we can stand in awe of. 
in verse 4 in Isaiah chapter 6, at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. And then here's where Isaiah says, woe to me, woe to me. What was Isaiah's reaction? He cried, I am ruined. I'm a man of unclipped li unclean lips. Unclipped lips, whatever. Unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Can you imagine for a moment with me seeing God? And what would be your position if you seen God? What would you think about? What would you say? I, I'm telling you, Isaiah realized he'd messed up. Woe to me! I'm a man of unclean lips. How about your lips? How about your heart? Think about this, okay? In that moment of realizing who God is, Isaiah felt clearly that he was wrong. Woe to me, he says. My depravity is not good. A prophet's job at this time was to pronounce blessings and woe upon the people on behalf of God. Isaiah pronounces woe upon himself. And that is his reaction to the holiness of God when he sees God. And he goes on, he says, he saw his sinfulness in the light of God's purity. The only recourse Isaiah could do is to be broken and become unclean and undone. Men will not come. This is really, really important. Men will not come. Women too. I'm just using men as a gender there. Friends, we will not come to God in humility until we see God in his majesty. Until we see God in his majesty, in his holiness. The story doesn't end there. What happens, it's amazing as Isaiah's reaction to God is, God's is even better. Then when the seraphim come flying down, that's what I picture, okay? It says when the seraphim come down with a live coal, he, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, with it he touched my mouth. and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Isaiah is not destroyed by God's holiness. He's transformed by God's holiness. You see, because God makes a way where there seems to be no way, and it's important that he makes a way for Isaiah to stand in his presence, and Isaiah confessed his sin, but the grace of atonement was offered. Isaiah conversed with God. He talked to God. God's holiness transforms him, erases his sin, atones for his impurity. God provides Isaiah in this time and for, and for me and you today at this time, right now, through his son on the death on the cross. We have atonement. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? I asked Noah, you know, as we were singing that song, I said, here am I, says me. You know, and he was really singing with me. I don't know what words he was singing, but he was trying do you think, you think God knew the answer? Who shall I send? Do you think God knows the answer? You ever think about that? Who shall I send? If he's asking you that today, send me. Here am I, send me. Send me. You would expect him to get out of there and have this awesome ministry and everyone would believe Hordes and hordes of people would come to the Lord because Isaiah has seen the Lord and now he can share it. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. I get the man. But anyway, let me worship God. He said, go and tell his people, verse 9, be ever hearing but never understanding. Be ever seeing but never perceiving. Make the heart of his people callous. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their lips and hear with their ears. And understand with their hearts and turn that. What kind of ministry is that? What is, is that depressing? Imagine that as your call. Isaiah was faithful to the Lord. And you can read about all of it in the following verses of Isaiah. But in Matthew 13, you know, he repeats this. It was, Jesus says, this is fulfilled to me. This very scripture was fulfilled to me. In John 12, 37 through 41, even after Jesus had performed, John 12, 37 through 41, even after Jesus had performed 
all these signs in the presence, they still would not believe him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet. Lord, who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about it. It, you know, in John 1, 1 through 14, we've been covering that. Vernon's been doing a great job on Wednesday night. If you're not here on Wednesday night, you need to make a plan to come. One is the, the, the meals are pretty doggone good and all those that are involved in that. But the other thing is the spiritual food is even better. The idea of unpacking John as we're going through it has really been good. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. You see, he was, in, he was with God in the beginning. And through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and life was the light of all mankind. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. I saw the Lord. Here am I, send me. You see, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the light. So that through him all might believe he himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives off light to every one of us was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. It's important that we see this. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. And then he goes on to say, the word became flesh and made his dwell among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son. In Revelation 17, verse 14, they will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and with him be his called, chosen, and faithful, me and you. He is high and exalted up. Let everyone who believes come to Jesus. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we'll have an opportunity here in just a minute for you to make that known to this body. If you need to make a confession that you haven't been doing what you've wanted to be doing, that you wanted to know this body to be praying for you, we'll have that opportunity as well. Right now, you know, woe to me, Isaiah cried out, and God helped transform his life, and he'll do the same for me and you. You see in the Hebrews 12, 14, it says, without holiness... No one, no one, no one will see the Lord. True salvation begins with a desire to be made holy. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 tells us that the purpose of salvation is to be holy and blameless in his sight. And continue to live as a Christian is to go contrary. To, excuse me, let me get that straight to continue to live in sin as a Christian is to go contrary to what God's very purpose for our salvation is. Holiness assures us of our salvation. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is, is here. The change is evident. If we know nothing of holiness are not grieved by our sins, do not even strive, even through falling at times, to live a life that reflects a deep desire to obey God. We may be indeed flattering ourselves. Wow. That's a hard thought, isn't it? But it's true. We have taken a look at God's holiness for the last month, and all he's asking is, he wants your heart, he wants your mind. If you have a need today, I'm going to ask Brian to come and lead us in a closing song or invitation song. And uh, just let's give it to God. Let's give it to God. Let him know that you are doing everything you can to be a servant of the king.